I would like to say hello to many friends uh, I am meeting tonight, uh, even if only at a distance. Uh, and if I may, Paul Cartridge, Caroline Dewalt, Pietro Vannicelli, um, uh, and uh, Paola Ceccarelli, uh, and Franco Basso, uh, and uh, uh, see, Rosalind Thomas, um, and Rosaria Manson, uh, and I apologize if I don't remember <laughs> everyone. So thank you uh, all for being here. Um, I, I want to say, first of all, that I'm presenting not a cutting edge piece of research, but simply an overview um, of discussions and problems um, which concerned me uh, and in the past years and uh, concern still now. So, uh, and the last thing I, I, I have to say that I must uh, apologize for my English. Well, uh, I met Arnaldo Momigliano a couple of times in Pisa when I was still an undergraduate. The Greek historian loved to talk to students when he came to teach at his Scuola Normale, usually once a year. I, I didn't owe him any advice on Herodotus, just a few terrifying invitations to read all of Vilamovitz. When in 1997, I attended the small conference organized in Turin by Nino Luraghi, from which the volume The Historian's Craft in the Age of Herodotus was derived, Momigliano, alas, was no longer with us. But there was so much talk about the oral tradition in Herodotus that I thought, in a way, Momigliano was still there in his Turin. Also, there was Oswin Murray, who had been very close to Momigliano. That's exactly when I began to realize that Momigliano's and Jacobi's idea of oral tradition was problematic, to say the least. In the following years, we all debated around the Detlef Failings thesis. Then Nino Luraghi gave his persuasive interpretation of the um, alleged quotations from local sources. Um, as regards me, I was participating in the debate from Trento. We all knew that Turin meeting had been decisive. My talk today aims to recall those discussions and the problems that resulted. I will dwell first on the ambiguities of the expression oral tradition, then ask where to find the oral tradition behind and beyond Herodotus' discourse on his own historia. And I will also say something about oral traditions as social memory, but just something. And above all, I will insist on narrative layers within the histories. In fact, I firmly believe that they should be seen, the history, I mean, as a colossal palimpsest of stories in which Herodotus' literary artistry is also a supreme ability to read and manipulate traditional narrative. Uh, now to the ambiguities of oral tradition. 100 years ago, Felix Jacobi vigorously argued that Herodotus drew traditions about the past not from written chronicles, but from oral information. For Jacobi, there were, it is well known, no records of past events in written form before Herodotus. Arnaldo Mumiliano agreed with him and considered Herodotus' histories well before reality became fashionable among classicists as the first and most important historical work based on 
what both of them called oral tradition, mündliche Überlieferung, Traditione Orale. Jacobi and Momigliano used such an expression to indicate the way in which information had reached Herodotus, but neither of them attempted to explain what they meant by it, or how these oral traditions were to be conceived. It is important to note that Jacobi and Momigliano understood oral tradition according to a literary template, as texts, in a way. And this inevitably led to discuss it only in terms of reliability, temporal reach of historical memory, and presence of biases. In a way, oral sources were subjected, or had to be subjected, to the same kind of critical scrutiny that 19th century source criticism applied to written sources. As a result, oral tradition often appeared unreliable and its informativity seriously limited. Moses Finley, for his part, was more aware of the nature of oral tradition. He knew that it conveys a selective and voluntary collective memory shaped by the needs of the society that hunts it down. But precisely because of this, it was for him, for Finley, warped by personal family or group interests. He further insisted that its temporal depth was limited to no more than three or four generations. So, easily altered, oral tradition didn't retain in any trustworthy memory of the past. In the 80s of the past century, an oral revolution took place in also in the study of Greek historiography, it was really a paradigm shift, which consisted in the interpretation of Herodotus' history as a work based on oral tradition, rather than simply composed using oral sources. Every credit for this must be attributed to Osri Murray, who made a groundbreaking use of Jan van Sina's study of African oral traditions. Uh, when Oswin Murray um, participated to a seminar held together with Momigliano uh, in, if I remember well, in 1977, uh, only the 1961 book of Jan van Sina had been published, not the second one, Oral Tradition as Oral History, 1985. So Osimare made, uh, I was saying, ground, groundbreaking use of Jan van Sina's studies of African oral traditions. And in this way, he pioneered an anthropological understanding of the narrative background of the histories. Not only did he recognize that in the histories are found habits of thought that are distinctive of oral culture, but also realized that the narrative as a whole shows a whole range of distinguishing features of the oral tradition. Speaking in even more general terms, in Murray's opinion, the sort of knowledge about the past which was to be found in Herodotus' work looked as it should if it had been transmitted for some generations by word of mouth rather than in the form of fixed texts. By the way, this had a significant consequence especially for the historians. Namely, that oral traditions could be actually distinguished from mere 
oral information, which was not necessarily messages transmitted to future generations as oral tradition is, as uh, story um, making part of oral tradition do. Um, and also um, was not a form of group memory reflecting the mindset of the group itself. Uh, casual uh, oral information, simple hearsay, tend to not reflect the mindset of the group, of the groups. But there was more to it than that, because after Murray began to exploit the results of the research on African oral traditions, it was realized that in Greek oral traditions, one could in fact recognize specific traits that are typical of the African ones, the identity value, the tendency to conform to the culture of the generations that recognize the tradition as valid and meaningful, the ease of structuring themselves according to recurring patterns, both in terms of content and chronological organization. Well, but where the oral traditions were to be looked for? In other words, how to spot oral traditions? For Jacobi, but also for Murray, and many others, the oral traditions embedded in the narrative fabric of the histories were those that Herodotus claimed to have collected from anonymous locals, epichorioi, or from informants whose name he supplied. He supplied. But the case of Cyrene and that of the Metapontum and Proconesus traditions about Aristias uh, shows that the traditions collected by Herodotus must have been different from those he claims to have reported as such. Let's have a closer look. In the case of the foundation story of Cyrene in book four, the division of information into two traditions, respectively of Tira, the metropolis, the mother country, and Cyrene, uh, the colony, must be credited to Herodotus with the intention of organizing a multiplicity of narrative materials dating back to different political environments and social groups, both before and after the fall of the Batyad monarchy. At the time of the Batyad kings, the tradition about Cyrene's origins was an integral part of monarchic power ideology. As it is quite clear from Pindar, who foregrounds the Delphic sanctioning of the dynasty, especially in the Pythian IV, and puts a strong emphasis on Batus' royal status. Herodotus' so-called Cyrenian tradition as a form which suits the new Republican political climate and dispenses with all the elements of the image of the past which the royal house had established. Thus, as regards the narratives labeled by Herodotus as Theran and Cyrenian, we cannot think of two different local narratives dating back to the origins of the city, of the, of the colony, whose contents Pindar blurred and Herodotus inquiry recovered later on and reported. We should posit quite a different scenario. When the monarchy fell, the Batia tradition disintegrated in a way. And at the time of the new regime, emerged again as a plurality of narratives of different length and nature, folk tales, 
legends linked to the founders' cult, genealogical traditions, or actual tales. In other words, the cluster of story must have been there. We must imagine then that Herodotus did not find a single oral tradition <clears throat> that was anonymous, collective, and officially sanctioned by the community. The main stories Herodotus came to know about, uh, to know about were distributed by him among what he called the traditions of Terra and Cyrene, respectively. He called, he called them so not because he was quoting his sources in a formal sense, or even because he was stating how he actually gathered his information. In fact, Herodotus gathered his information in a different way. For him, speaking of the traditions of Thera and Cyrene meant crediting the two communities with those contents he thought were relevant for both of them. He was in a position to recognize often pertinently what mattered to the communities whose past he was recounting. Uh, these stories about Aristeas of Procone Proconesus, the alleged author of a poem on the Arimaspians, uh, give many clues that point in the same direction. Herodotus recounts those stories in Book 4, precisely in a few chapters, uh, 13th to 15th, in which he notably insists on the cognitive efficacy of Akoe, of his Akoe and his autopsy, and just as clearly exhibits his authority. Now, especially interesting are two stories which Herodotus say, says he heard both in Proconesus and Sisychus and in Metaponto. The stories are presented as what the cities say. It's important, to, it's important to note that such narratives are intertwined between them and should be seen as one of the most relevant examples of dovetailing traditions, to put it, uh, to put it in Failing's words, in the histories. Um, and uh, it is well known, uh, uh, traditions uh, of different uh, places, very distant among them, cannot perfectly dovetail between them. Uh, so far from being a revelation of the principle and method of research employed by Herodotus, as Reginald Macan had it. Uh, uh, this, uh, these stories, <clears throat> uh, allegedly heard in Proconesus and in Metapontum, strongly confirm that when Herodotus reports local knowledge, explicitly attributing it to the locals, he often is not stating how he actually gathered his information, nor he is quoting his sources in a formal sense again. A close examination of the chapters on Aristias makes clear uh, that Herodotus is not reporting two distinct Polish traditions. The Proconesian story both presupposes an Aristias legend based upon the poem and the wide diffusion of pieces of knowledge not of local origin. As regards the Metapontine story as constructed by Herodotus, we can trace a multifaceted knowledge of different origins, such as 
elements of the legend of Aristias itself widely circulating in the Greek world, details of the Proconnesian story, aspects of Western Greek and Metapontine lore, autopsy by Herodotus himself. Thus, there are reasons to argue that Herodotus selected, collected, and manipulated information gathered in various ways and in various and in different places. Probably he, did, he didn't invent anything, but visibly shaped two local stories and credited Proconesus and Metaponton with them. One is led to think that Herodotus had retrieved a kind of kaleidoscope of information, both local and international, both autopsy-derived and written, but was keen to present the overall sense of his history as the local knowledge of Metapontum and Proconesus. Okay. Um, this leads us to wonder whether we can figure out at least some aspects of Herodotus' practice of history. It's true that the secrets of Herodotus' workshop are not yet all out, as once Momigliano famously said, but I think we can get an idea of the process of recording information by Herodotus. As it is well known, some scholars see Herodotus, uh, or have seen, as a kind of modern anthropologist working in the field and recording oral traditions. But even assuming that Herodotus was the last link in the transmission chain, we cannot simply think of tradition which were, so to speak, ready to be recorded. For anthropology itself suggests some methodological caution. One should especially avoid underestimating the impact of any recording situation on the character and the organization itself of the information transmitted. Indeed, it seems to me that we cannot take for granted even the concept itself of recording situation. The evidence, I think, points to the different conclusion that we should think that Herodotus didn't gather all his information at once, all his local information at once. In my opinion, Robert Fowler was right in assuming that Herodotus, quote, inquired, thought a bit, inquired some more, then thought some more. Moreover, we should imagine a transmission of information which is in fact, and this is an important point for me, a relationship between different sides, uh, a kind of a social process, I mean, involving negotiation between the informants and the content of the information they convide on the one hand, and the historian, his mindset, and the information he already holds on the other. I would go so far as to argue that Herodotian inquiry may have been may have played the role of a catalyst of the tradition itself, at least in some cases. Okay, um, so those who have followed me so far might wonder now how Epicorio Itzitate, Jacobi, or Acoe statements, Luraghi, should be ultimately interpreted. This remained a problem to be solved for a long time until the solution was discerned by Gordon Shrimpton and by myself and defiantly argued by Neil Raghi. 
The Epicorio it citate mentioned the communities that, according to Herodotus, could not fail to consider the stories reported as significant. I would not say as true, but that's another problem. In other words, these kinds of citations are intended to make information clearly identifiable through its attribution to a specific local community on the assumption that local knowledge of the past was a shared heritage within local communities. One could say, to use Henri Mognot's terminology, taken up by Jan Van Sina, by myself, and by Nino Luraghi, that for Herodotus the police were the social surface of local knowledge. Social surface here means the social and cultural context where traditions are preserved and regarded as relevant. Um, it's also important to note that the attribution to local communities of knowledge of the past was perhaps the clearest way for Herodotus himself and in the vein of the culture of the narrative tradition that pre-existed him, to sort and classify the patchwork of narrative materials of the most varied origins in time and space used in the histories. Herodotus, of course, reformulated these materials and attributed them, as we have seen, to specific local communities. After the considerations so far, another salient point needs to be touched upon. As every reader of the histories knows, many narratives are not, or only partially are, presented by Herodotus as oral information. But it jumps to the eye that they follow a logic of traditional motifs recurring in traditional stories of a different kind, which we call international folklore, or myths, or legends. Acquaintance with both the texts of the history, of the histories and international oral tale may give us an, an idea of the traditional narrative material Herodotus incorporated into the fabric of his work. One might consider, for instance, Adrastos' story in uh, Crisis Logos, the birth and childhood of Cyrus, the stories about Cypselus and Periander, the legend of Battos, the founder of Cyrene, the story of Evenios of Paros, or the enthronement of Darius the Great as king of the Persians. But many, many others could be given, could be given, of course. I dwell for a moment on two cases. Crisus Logos as a whole, and the story of the South Italian doctor, Democides. Thanks to the classicist and folklorist, Victor Hansen, and his analysis, as followed and indeed refined by Nino Raghi, who in turn has followed in the path led out by Wolfgang Ali, the Lydian Logos, and especially the stories of Gyges and Croesus, turn out to be some sort of a manipulated version of a legendary account of the vicissitudes of the Mermnod dynasty. Such a legendary account, in turn, must have drawn several motifs from the international tale type known as Our Lady's Child, Arne Thompson Uther, number 710. Jaiji's entering Candoyle's bedroom and seeing what was forbidden, 
Croesus' damp song regaining his voice in the end, Croesus on the pyre and the divine intervention, all of these motifs appear also and already in the folk tale narrative. Quite notably, however, the role of the protagonists of the folk tale is split among the two main historical figures in Herodotus' story. I mean, Gyges and Croesus. And some of the motifs are used to tell the tale of the rise of Gyges to power and some others to shape the story of the fall of Croesus. In other words, some of the motifs of a folklore story as well as its plot, must have migrated to a historical legend on the rise and fall of the kings of Lydia and have been used uh, with reference to the first judges and the last quizzes. The process evidently implied the uh, disarticulation of the folkloric plot. We should assume then that between international folklore and Herodotus history, histories, sorry, there is a narrative tradition of legendary character which adopted and transformed folklore stories and in turn was profoundly reshaped by Herodotus. Uh, almost the same holds true for Herodotus' account of the career of Demosides. If one looks deeply into it, as Alan Griffiths and more recently Malcolm Davis did, the story of the Greek doctor uh, brought before the Greek, the Greek king in fetters appears to be imbued with uh, a lot of folk tale elements uh, which structure it to the point that it makes no sense at all to assume that Herodotus put together his narration out of folk tale motifs he picked out from international oral tale, uh, exactly as in the case of. Uh, the logos about uh, the Memnad kings. The conclusion is almost inevitable, in my view, that Herodotus was drawing on a pre existing oral narrative deriving from Samos, perhaps, or South Italy, or both. What Herodotus came to know had already lost its folk tale format to become a quasi historical legend. Um, on a more general level, so we may assume that Herodotus did not put together his patterned narratives out of, of rough data or small pieces of factual information. He defiantly didn't translate historical events into traditional storytelling item, as Detlev Failing tended to think. And more recently, Katharina Wesselman, in an insightful but not quite satisfactory book, is inclined to believe. Quite on the contrary, Herodotus had traditional stories at his disposal from the foundation tales of colonies, through the tyrant stories, to narrative concerning Near Eastern kings and oracular tales, what emerges from any close reading of the history is the influence exerted on, on them by a mass of oral traditions already cast into narrative form. This obviously means that oral tradition consisted of narratives with a strong traditional character. And that Theodotus often reshapes, refocuses, and contextualizes narratives rooted deep in our tradition, 
even when he does not present his narrative as a story drawn from oral influence. Needless to say, when traditional material is given a different meaning by Herodotus, then the stories he uses, we get strong evidence in my view, both of the existence, of the sheer existence of traditional narratives behind the histories and of their reinterpretation by Herodotus. One case in point is the story of Cypsurus, uh, where the legend of his birth and rise to power dates back to the time when he was in power. Um, under the tyrants, the legend had a strong legitimizing power, while for Herodotus, the story of Cypsurus it exemplifies the evils brought about by tyranny. It's enlightening to take a closer look at the narrative in Book 5, Chapter 92. It contains, undoubtedly, strong elements of folktale and mythological motifs. Uh, just a few examples. The telling name of the mother of the hero, Labda, her lameness, her reversal of fortune from marginality to marriage and from sterility to prodigious pregnancy, and lastly, the crucial, the crucial role played by a threatening child, Cypselos, rescued from murder and doomed to be a strong ruler. The story of Cypselos as a whole as a whole, is rooted in folktale narrative. But in 7th century Corinth, it became a significant oral tradition, which granted a new status to its protagonist. One can see in this light the representational strategy of the oracular tale, which emphasizes Delphic intervention, and the strength and justice of the new ruler. The same legitimizing function is performed by the story of the childhood and rise to power of Labda's child, which is clearly derived from the Near Eastern Sargon legend, the foundation myth par excellence of Mesopotamian kingship. Nevertheless, Herodotus emphasized emphasizes the in inevitable evils that would arise from Cypselus in Corinth, from the tyrant of Corinth. And has the Corinthian speaker Socles used Cypselus' story to highlight the horror of tyranny? So we cannot believe that Herodotus intends the Cypselus episode as a story ad maiorem gloriam of the tyrant. Indeed, Herodotus ascribes an anti-tyrannical significance to a tradition built in the originally built in the interests of the tyrant Cypselus, most likely still in the seventh century. This is an interesting example, in my view, of narrative layering detectable in the histories. Stories of different origins and milieus that in Cypselid times gave rise to a legend of legitimacy of the new ruler, survived to some extent to the fall of the tyrants, then they were reshaped and given a different meaning by the fools of the tyrants, and in the end uh, were used by Herodotus himself. I dare to think that it's wrong to deny the possibility of discerning traditional narratives behind the test of the histories. Um, Katharina Wesselman uh, makes this, and this is the, the most uh, relevant problem in his book. 
Of course, when it comes to uncovering strengths of earlier tradition in the stories recounted by Herodotus, one should be extremely cautious. Now to a remark about the, communic the communicative nature of the tradition Herodotus had before him. So far, we have labeled these traditions as oral. However, a qualification is in order here. In a not insignificant number of cases behind, uh, no, sorry. In a not insignificant number of cases, um, in the histories, tradition can be traditions can be detected that might best be described as semi-oral. Such traditions can result from oral forms of communication interacting with written forms and reformulating them in the so-called orature, but also written materials such as oracular responses, retrai, decrees, and pseudo-documents such as the Pact of the First Settlers of Cyrene, which in turn influenced the content of oral communication itself. Think, for example, of those Delphic oracles so deeply embedded in Herodotus' account of the history of Cyrene after the establishment, the foundation of the colony, there are reasons to assume that a collection was made of those responses, which was also open to later additions. Such a written material must have been circulating, and in this way, it would have been quoted, summarized, retold in prose, or simply hinted at by local oral tradition, which uh, should be called. Um, from this point of view, a semi-oral tradition. I recognize that I have drawn a complex and problematic picture, which prompts many further questions to those of us who study, who study the histories. We have to face the problem of reading a deep and very complex narrative and cultural stratification. Indeed, also in the stories that existed before Herodotus wrote them, one can recognize, as we have, see, we have seen, processes of layering and interaction between different narrative materials. One wonders then whether it's possible to discern the many different voices in time and space within collective tradition. Is there a social surface, or at least is it discernible, uh, a social surface of those voices? And are we able to relate them back to it? Is it possible to get a sense of the mutual interactions of those narrative materials? And what about the modifications they must have undergone in this process? In sum, the question is how to read this palimpsest of stories that is Herodotus' work. In conclusion, it seems important to point out that the recent narrative turn has certainly increased the understanding in literary terms of Herodotus. Equally important, perhaps even more important, is that it has begun to illuminate, think for example of Chris Pelling's recent volume, the various subtle ways in which the history's narrative contribute to the explanation of events even more than authorial statements and commentaries do. And yet, 
It seems to me difficult to discuss Herodotian narrative without also contextually investigating the traditional oral and semi-oral narratives that were behind and beyond the, the histories. Without descending into the anonymous depths, as Alan Griffiths put it, from which Herodotus retrieved traditional narratives without investigating the narrative layering of his work and the pre-existing stories that are recirculated in it. One cannot hope to truly understand Herodotus and the storytelling culture that he still understood so well. As for the historians of archaic Greece, they work understandably has become much more complicated. And I don't think it will get any simpler in the near future. It seems to be clear now that we cannot rely on a direct echo of the social memory of those times. The point here is that we have come to understand that there were no official collective traditions of the, politi of the political communities and kingdoms uh, as a whole, and that there were not even those kernels of local tradition that Herodotus claimed to have had from the locals. Things, as we have seen, were much more complicated, and Herodotus constructed and attributed at least as much as he reported. He was, I quote, certainly not the innocent eye, as Murray put it but rather a very self-conscious manipulator of the stories he reports. The important point, however, is that between the events and the memory of them on the one hand, and Herodotus' text on the other, there are narrative materials that don't precisely reflect community memories. Nevertheless, oral and semi-oral traditions still represent the archaic memory culture, namely that kind of culture that it's integral to the self-understanding and the sense of identity to say nothing of the construction of a significant past of social groups. What has just been observed implies the need not to separate the reflection on oral tradition from the more general reflection on the forms characteristics and ways in which the past is remembered and handed down. Indeed, not only some historians of the Greek archaic age, but also specialists of other historical periods, such as medievalists, increasingly tend to operate within a methodological frame of reference that includes the sociology and anthropology of memory. Among other things, both of these disciplines converge with the results of the investigation of the mechanisms of oral tradition made by anthropologists, by field, even by field anthropologists. One aspect of the greatest importance of this convergence between the study of oral tradition and memory studies is the notion that the past does not settle in memory by its very nature and as such, but is a cultural artifact, the result of reconstruction on the basis of elements and needs drawn from the present, which continuously reorganizes it, uh, reorganize, uh, itself. In this process of ongoing restructuring, therefore, memory does not function as a repository of memories of facts, but selects, rearranges, and suppresses elements and data according to cultural patterns and models that have a social character. Memory, therefore, has the character of a social fact. As regards Herodotus, he had an astounding familiarity with the forms of social memory embedded in archaic oral tradition. 
realizing what this familiarity means and understanding the ways in which oral tradition and social memory interacted in archaic Greece is perhaps even more difficult than understanding Herodotus as a literary artist and a historical thinker. Yet, after so many years, difficult things have not ceased to attract us. Thank you all for your time and your kind attention.